The Power Hour is on the air, live streaming on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Twitch. I'm your host, Michael Bishop, and thank you for joining me on this Monday evening. And I've got a lot of explaining to do, especially with what had been going on the last couple of days with the schedule. Now, at first, we had a guest lined up. Sean Cauldron from the Tennessee Wire uh, has done a lot of writing work for USA Today and Yahoo Sports. We were going to have him on the show originally, and unfortunately, a situation came up that was unfortunate circumstances, and due to that, we basically had to reschedule him for next week. Then the original plan that we had with Sean, I got in contact with my buddy P. Shark and asked if he was going to come on and do the show with me, if he could fill in, and he said yes. But unfortunately... He forgot he had a prior engagement to do, especially, and I discussed it with him, and it's how it is, you know, last-minute things where people just have things that come up and schedule conflicts. So, really, this one's on me, everybody. So, I apologize. Originally, the, we did have some really good guests for lined up for the show, and just unfortunate circumstances turned their ugly heads, and it's just how life is, you know. Sometimes we just have moments that come up and there's nothing we can really do about it, but try and make it a better situation. So I do apologize for having the guests on, especially in the promos. I know that's probably going to be a letdown, but I promise you we're going to have a great show tonight. I've done a lot of work. I've been doing a lot of draft work. So very excited to get everybody in. I'm Michael Bishop. Welcome to the Power Hour. And of course, our buddy Lou Man is first into the chat and looks like he got second too good seeing you on the show Lou man it's always great to have you on so once again i apologize for the lack of guests scheduling conflict we had to reschedule so sean calden will be on next week and we will have titan's time podcast on as well so my apologies we're gonna have a great show no problems you just roll with the punches we'll do what we got to do today no, no big deal. I promise you. We'll have a good show. So let's just go ahead and jump into our top news, throwing in the little screen, and let's get going. A lot of big goings on going on today, so let's see what we got first. And basically, for the first story going on, it definitely seems that there's a lot of interest going around for A.J. Brown. And it's no surprise, especially this being a contract year for him. And... Already a report coming out that the Jets are very interested to possibly going after some very key name receivers, especially Debo, especially DK Metcalf, and of course, A.J. Brown being on that list as well. So naturally, it was easy for John Robinson to be asked these questions, and Robinson basically made it clear, we want A.J. to be a Tennessee Titan. And there's no question about that, that he's going to do whatever he can to get this deal done. So... You know, along the lines, I think it's one of those deals where you have a story that just pops out with a source and people just take something that small and minuscule and just pick it up and run with it. Just as much as this one. And of course, A.J. Brown's going to have a lot of interest, especially receiver needy teams. And you know that he wants to get paid. And the biggest key factor here is he's a very important piece of Tennessee's offense that's not named Derrick Henry. So going forward, you know A.J. Brown is going to at least want a long-term deal. He's going to want to be paid like some of the higher receivers around the league, especially right after the Tyreek Hill deal came out. But, you know, along the lines you have to consider, especially the unfortunate incidences where he's had his injuries during the last couple of seasons, and it has limited especially what he can do. And really you want to see what more he can do on and off the field, but especially knowing that he's coming into a contract year and it's vital that Tennessee uses him to the best of his ability. So for me, I feel that they're going to do whatever they can to get him at least maybe top seven, top five when it comes to paying receivers and make no mistake. AJ Brown is going to make a great deal of money. They're going to do whatever it takes to keep him in two tone blue. I have no doubt about it. John Robinson is more than likely Preparing many a deal, especially knowing that the best option they have right now is this time in between 
before the draft and right before the start of training camp. So I have no doubt that John Robinson's going to get this deal done. I have no doubt that between June and August is when this will probably come to be a fruition. So that would be my deadline. I think they're going to try and hit it between those months. And J-Rob does a pretty good job of that. So, you know, along those lines, I'm really interested to see how this will play out. I know a lot of people understand that it's going to take a lot of back and forth. You know, AJ wants to get paid the amount he feels he's right and rightfully going to be paid. So the biggest thing going forward is to make sure that he handles what he needs to do on the field And more than likely, they'll get this hammered out before the start of the regular season. So, like I said, June, August should be a pretty easy contract. I don't think there'll be any doubts there. That's usually standard procedure, but John Robinson's really good at getting this done. And A.J. Brown, more than likely, will be a Tennessee Titan for the next five to six years. So hitting our next story, and of course, every receiver out there that's making themselves big out in the news and making their name even bigger. You have to remember another receiver that's going to be having their contract up at the end of the year is Cooper Cup. And Cup has had an MVP type year of last year and really come out of the woodworks and just showed that he's ready to be an elite star in the league. And of course, right now the Rams are basically going to be tied up in a lot of deals going forward. And the key component is they need to keep their key players here. And Cooper Cup is one of them. So along those lines, once again, the Rams are kind of in the same position. They know they need to keep their playmakers. They've locked down a quarterback for a good chunk of time, so that shouldn't be a problem. But they also have a lot of other bigger contracts that they have to worry about, especially with Jalen Ramsey, especially trying to lock down another deal with Aaron Donald. So if they lose Cooper Cup, then they're losing a very key component of their offense. So what are the Rams going to have to do in order to make a long-term deal? Well, really, I think they're probably going to have to cut a few of the heavy contracts and probably do a lot of restructuring. So looking down the road, understanding that right now they're trying to keep a lot of their key guys. Vaughn Miller was one of them before he decided to sign with Buffalo. I know they're trying to work a deal out with Odell Beckham to keep him going. So you really have to try and think that restructuring is going to be one of the ways they're going to have to try and keep them. But another way is they're probably going to have to just cut a few guys loose, especially some of the heavier contracts. And you expect that there's going to be a lot of dead money coming, especially from the Rams camp, which is basically necessary. If I have to cut some players loose in order to keep my one guy that I know is going to thrive with Matthew Stafford as my quarterback, then that's got to be what I have to do. So if I'm the Rams, that's the best safe scenario. They know they can't lose Cooper Cup, and if he does go out on the free agent market, he's not going to be out there long because there's many great teams looking for a great receiver to line up with their quarterbacks, and I promise you they will pay him. So the Rams have to do whatever they can to probably get a deal done maybe before the end of the year. I think if they could get a deal done before camp, this will definitely help their chances. The quicker, the better, but... Cooper Cup, especially knowing that this being a contract year, is going to want to get paid, and they're going to have to do it quickly. Also in breaking news today, it appears that Fox has found their number one play-calling analyst, and it will be Kevin Bernhardt. No surprise. And I actually called this a couple weeks ago on my earlier shows, and really he has already had the experience alongside with Greg Olson, and I really like them as Fox number two team. They did a really great job last year, and I really think he's ready to step up in that role. He's got a great voice. He's got a great personality, and I think Fox did the right thing by keeping him. So, you know, it's a big loss, especially losing Joe Buck, but at the same time, you knew that he was ready to basically step up into this number one role. Kevin Burkhart, to me, really is one of those guys that have been kind of hiding in the wings, and if you watched a lot of the secondary games or the first one o'clock games on Fox, you know, him and Greg Olson really have great connection right there so the biggest thing right now is they're still discussing the color commentator and greg olson is in the mix for that slot and i think that's the best choice right there i know fox would probably want to go out and hit a home run higher here i think if they go out and get a peyton manning or just any kind of player with good personality then they're going to try and do it but you've already got it like i said 
uh, at least a couple weeks ago on a previous show, you know, you don't have to search too far, but on in your own backyard. And Fox did the right thing. They moved Burkhardt up to the number one slot. And I think the smarter option here is to bring Olsen along with them. They're dynamic as well. They work to get well together. And, you know, they don't have to change a lot. That's the best part. When you got something that works, there's no need to change it. The best thing they've done is just to move them up to that one slot, and Fox is going to be fine. So Kevin Burkhart and you have Greg Olson, that's a win. And not to mention Fox will be broadcasting at least two of those Super Bowls with that crew, and I think that's a good thing. So I don't think it'll take long to get that deal done. I think if Fox really just sits down and at least lets Burkhart have a say in this, I know he'll stick up for Olsen. They've already got great chemistry, and sometimes you just don't break that up, and you just let that play out. You know, some of the great ones that have done it, you know, Madden, Al Michaels, Madden, Pat Summerall, you know, they could have that dynamic. And I'm not saying they're on that level. But, you know, when you see talent, especially in the broadcasting booth, you want to elevate it. You want to keep it where you have. And Fox has already done the right thing by keeping one part of it. Hopefully Greg Olson will follow, and we'll just see how that goes as we wait and see if their decision comes anytime soon. Also in breaking news, if you're a Buffalo Bills fan, well, I've got good news for you. Apparently now you have a chance to have a brand new stadium by the end of the 2026 season. As it has been reported, there is a deal in place to build a new stadium in Orchard Park for about $1.4 billion, and this will be for a 30-year lease. So, Really, this is probably going to come into fruition as soon as they sign the papers and the ink's dried. Then they'll start digging right next door, which more than likely I believe the site will be right next to the stadium. No brainer. So, kind of similar to the Tennessee Titans situation, or Buffalo basically has just said, you know, they looked out for their best options. And at the moment, they knew they were going to have to try and put a new stadium in especially with the Bills being relevant now. And Josh Allen has definitely drawn a crowd. And at this point, the Bills are making money hand over fist, especially with the talent they have and for the way it's going. So the one drawback is that, yes, they have a new stadium being built. The thing is, Buffalo has already opted. It will be an open-air stadium. So there won't be a retractable roof. Uh as you see in the illustration right here, it possibly will have a covering, possibly to keep some of the fans out of the snow, which I think is a good thing. But still, the Buffalo fans, I think it was part of their just look and the part of their heritage as a Buffalo Bills fan. There used to be an outdoor, so I don't think this was a big deal. Really, it was just along the lines of replacing a very dilapidated stadium, which should have been done maybe 20 years earlier. So the good part for Buffalo is this is already done. They're just going to have to start filling out the contracts and the legal stuff, and then more than likely they'll start doing work probably as soon as the season's over with in 2023. So Buffalo's going to move really quick and have the stadium open possibly by 2026, and more than likely it's going to be a very good situation for Buffalo Bills fans. I know taxes eventually will go up, as that does in stadium deals, but that's part of the deal, you know. As it is funded, it's going to be funded partially by the state of New York, and it's going to be partially funded by the owner, which there's other things in play with that. But at the same time, you know, a new venue in Orchard Park, I think that's going to draw a lot more attention. You're definitely going to draw more crowds, concerts. You know, it's not just made for football. And that could potentially even bring in, you know, possibilities for other sports such as soccer. So, it's really just a situation where they know they're going to have to move quickly to get this done, but they had the right people in and they made the right decisions. So good for Buffalo. Buffalo stadium is a go and should be open by 2026. And finally, as it seems Detroit's luck has finally turned. Well, not a lot of people are really happy about some of the decisions that were made today in two news drops for the Detroit lions. They will be apparently hosting Hard Knocks this year on HBO, which is the television series that has been on since 2001, and has had a variety of different players and teams and coaches as the seasons progress. 
And not only that, but in a double dose of news, Detroit has also won the rights to host the NFL Draft for the 2024 season. And much to the demay of fans, they're kind of lukewarm about it. (laughs) I'm not surprised. It's Detroit, and, you know, Detroit's one of those economies that's just kind of just teetering up and down. There are things that are helping make it a little better transition. You know, the city's growing, but unfortunately you still have the parts around the city that have just been a complete mess and a nightmare from a financial and even building standpoint. But, you know, along the lines, it was interesting to see that Detroit won this. I really thought that Green Bay that was in the running was more likely going to end up with the draft for that year. You know, a lot of tradition there in Green Bay. I think the win- the weather would have been fine because it would have been late April, so I don't think that would have been a big problem. But, you know, I just I don't think it's a bad spot to have it in. I don't think the draft is a bad idea to do it in Detroit. I just think really along the lines, Detroit knows they're going to have to nail this. And... I don't expect that they expect a Super Bowl to get back to Detroit anytime soon, especially the way Super Bowl 40 went, and I don't think there's a lot of interest there. So you really have to think that Detroit knows that going into the draft, when they get the opportunity to host it, they're going to have to try and hit every nail on the head on this one. And as far as them being on hard knocks, I mean... I'm fine with the long diversity of teams that get to be on the show. I mean, you've had repeated teams, especially like the Raiders or the Bengals or the Cowboys, that have been on there consistently. So it's nice to see variety. And really the storylines there are going to be interesting. You know, Jared Goff will definitely be one that's watched over. Dan Campbell's an entertaining character. So you really feel that he's going to fit in well, especially in that situation on camera and trying to get his players ready and find the best roster that they can and Detroit's not in a bad situation they've got the most draft picks in the 2022 draft they've got a lot of things going for them especially at the end of the season they did where you had a team that was really starting to get hot at the right time and starting to win a few games so You know, I think this is Detroit's big break. I think they finally had a little luck move their way, especially since they've had so much negativity going around. People just generally don't seem interested, especially with them being in the draft. But, (coughs) excuse me, I think it's a win for them. And Detroit definitely needs to win, and many wins as much as they can. (coughs) Excuse me. All right, guys, I'm going to take a quick 30 second break. And when I come back, we're going to discuss why the Tennessee Titans should draft a quarterback in 2023. And I promise you, I brought all the info I could bring. And I'm going to make sure that you understand that in the long term run of things, this would be the very best option for the Titans going forward. I'm Michael Bishop with the Power Hour, and we'll be back in 30 seconds. The Power Hour is on the air, live streaming on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Twitch. I am your host, Michael Bishop, and thank you for joining me on this Monday evening. It's great to see everyone back and watching the show. And I always want to make sure that for all our viewers, if you love the show, help it grow. Make sure that you're following us on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Twitch at the Power Hour 615. And don't forget for our YouTube viewers... Don't forget to subscribe, like, and ring the bell for more content on your way out after you're done watching the show. It's great having everybody in. 
let's get to some of our comments real quick. And I guess that's one of the best parts about not having a lot of guests. You can actually sit and read the comments a little easier as they go forward. So shout out to Titan Pratt. What's up, man? Good seeing you, buddy. Lou Man says, me too. He also says, Detroit is tired of bad teams. And, you know, I understand. I just, it's nice to see Detroit get a win in this. And I know there's a lot of things going forward with the draft and with, you know, hard knocks being on there. I think it helps elevate them. And Dan Campbell's a character. And I think that's really one of the selling points of hard knocks. So you have somebody that's very locked in that just has a way of just communicating with his players. So it's a win-win. I don't think it's a bad situation at all for him. And of course our buddy Al Pierce joining us. Tighten up, tighten up as always. Oh goodness. Well, let's go ahead and get to our next segment. Sorry guys. I just got to refocus here. (laughs) All right, let's go ahead and get into it. Tennessee is looking forward to the 2022 draft. And, of course, you have a lot of people basically talking about bringing in a quarterback this year. And, of course, my take is I don't think this is the best year to draft a quarterback. Now, not all of them are bad. In fact, I think there's a few of these quarterbacks in this draft this year that would do pretty well. I just don't think they would fit the system that Tennessee runs. I just think there's, you know, characteristic problems And I think that there's other things you have to look at moving forward. So really along the lines, it just leads me to the biggest question and the biggest debate right now. And that would be why the Tennessee Titans should draft a quarterback in 2023. So here's what you have to remember. When a team's window opens up for a Super Bowl... You should do everything that you can do at every possibility, at every turn, to maximize it. Now, I know everybody felt just distraught and upset, especially the way Tannehill played, but there's too many variables this year. We weren't going to be able to trade him to a team that was willing to take on that much of a salary hit. Even if Green Bay did, they were going to keep Aaron Rodgers. That was going to happen one way or the other. That being said, you felt that eventually there has to be a change if things can continue to progress. And as willing as I am to let Ryan Tannehill have the benefit of the doubt this year, and I hope he proves me wrong, I hope he proves a lot of people wrong, but the thing is, I'm also thinking two steps ahead. And let's take into consideration the following. Back when the Kansas City Chiefs had the opportunity to, in 2017, they traded up 17 spots to draft Patrick Mahomes, and this changed everything. That's all there is to it. At the time, they had Alex Smith, and he was serviceable. He was getting them where they needed to go, but they weren't getting over the hump. So at the time, they traded him to Washington, and with that extra pick, that gave them more capital and along the lines, helped them move up 17 spots from 27 to 10th in order to draft Patrick Mahomes. Now, at the time, Mahomes had a lot of suitors, and a lot of people were really going after him. Kansas City was a little under the radar. I think, really, at that time, the Raiders were a big team. I think Chicago was kicking the tires, and even the 49ers at the time were kicking the tires. Kansas City kind of came out of nowhere with the late trade and nabbed him. So my point is, sometimes you just take a chance on a guy. And at that time, nobody really knew what Patrick Mahomes was going to be. No one knew at that time that he was going to be the breakout star that he was. In a lot of the mock drafts that I looked back at, he had an average grade of either an A to a B+. You had some people that liked his mechanics. You had some people that questioned his leadership skills. You had some people say he got frustrated, especially later in games, and started making more mistakes. You know, the lists and variables go on. But all in all, were the same. They felt that he had a very high ceiling. So, Kansas City winning in that situation, you know that a lot of teams followed suit. If they have a championship window, then they are going to try and maximize it, even if they have to hand the reins over to a younger quarterback. 
Does it work all the time? No. But sometimes you have to take that risk. And for the Tennessee Titans, if it comes down to that, there's only two players that I think that are going to fit that mold. And the first one, C.J. Stroud. Coming from Ohio State, 44 touchdowns, 4,435 yards, and a 71.9 completion percentage. He's probably one of the most accurate quarterbacks I have seen in the last 15 years. I love the kid's game. I love his attitude. I love the way he carries himself. To me, he is probably going to be the number one pick going forward. Now, I know there are a lot of people that think, you know, he's still got a lot to brush up on his game. He makes a lot of bad decisions, and sometimes he forces a lot of throws. And that's part of it. He's still a kid. He's still learning. But his potential right now is unlimited. Even right now as we speak, If he was in this year's draft, he'd go number one overall. No doubt in my mind. If he was in this year's draft, he would be the number one overall pick. And believe me, there would be teams fighting over for him because he's that good. And his ceiling could be that high. So, of course, you have to look at the number two who would be going into this draft. And he could potentially overshadow C.J. Stroud if he has another year like he does. And, of course, you know I'm talking about... Bryce Young. Bryce Young basically coming out of the woodworks, starting for Alabama last year, and ending up being the Heisman Trophy winner. 4,872 yards, 47 touchdowns, with a 66.9 completion percentage, which is pretty good. And at that time, the one thing I like about Bryce Young, he wants to throw in the pocket. He's not going to be afraid to try and run it out. He wants to try and get bigger yardage plays. He's a great leader. He's a great young man. I think he's going to do very well in the NFL game. My only concern is I think if he put about maybe 20 or 25 pounds on him, I'd feel a little better because he's a little light for a quarterback. But that hasn't hampered him in his playmaking abilities. He's quick, his arm's strong, and he has a good sense of finding receivers. So along those lines, to me, those are going to be the best quarterbacks in the draft. And... It's going to come down to two things. The two teams in the drafting positions, at one and two, are going to draft them, no questions asked, because they're once-in-the-generation talent. And I think this is probably one of the best years that's going to be for quarterbacks. And I could go on and on, but these two quarterbacks right now, whoever drafts them, I feel, is going to help set their franchise on a strong course for correcting itself if they build the right pieces around them. That being said, you would have to imagine trying to get up there and trading for them. And let's be honest, Tennessee is in no position to try and make a deal right now. But it's a doable deal. And how is that going to work out? Well, the thing is, Tennessee continues to draft in the low 26s to even 32. So... Going in that range, Tennessee hasn't broke out of the lower 20s. They continue to find themselves in that draft situation. So you look at it this way. What will it take to move to number one overall? Because that's what they're going to have to do. Tennessee's not going to be drafting in higher areas. They're not going to obtain a draft pick magically to get up there. They have to find a way to move up to one or two. Preferably one. Because if you're going to go... If you're going to go big in a championship window, in a championship time that you have it, go big. So, what is it going to take? Well, first off, let me introduce you to something that's going to help sell this. And this is the NFL trade value chart. Now, what this is, is basically a cheat sheet that GMs and head coaches use mainly on draft nights. Now, the numbers are not 100% accurate. They change, they vary but this is kind of an example of what they are. Now, in order to draft up for the number one spot, as you see in the little boxes, at number one at Jacksonville, you see 3,000. Now, what that indicates is you would have to have draft capital of 3,000 in order to move up to that number one slot. Now, as you can see where I have up on top, you see Tennessee draft capital 947.9. Now, that number basically pertains to the draft capital that Tennessee has. 
So for the seven picks that they have, that basically equals up to the 947 point. But we'll round it up to 948. The points usually come about in the sixth and the fifth rounds. So you'll start seeing points in the later fourths, but eventually they start coming up to fruition where you start adding points around there. So that's where the points come from. But as you see, Tennessee in the green, this is how that equals up to the 948 that they have. Each pick is worth a certain amount of points. So at 26 right now, they have 700. At three, where they have no number two pick, since they have 90, they have 140. At 143, they have 34.5. 131, they have 41 points. 169 is 22.2. 204 is 8.2. And 219 is just two. And generally, basically everything in the seventh round is one. So that's why seventh round picks are easier to move around, especially at draft day. They generally just cap out at one. They're very easily expendable. So Tennessee only having 497 in draft capital, knowing if they would have to move up to 3,000 for that number one slot. So here's where it comes into play. This is where future picks come in. And this is where you have to understand why they put in future picks for maybe if at least two years. Most GMs don't like doing more than two or three, but especially if knowing they have to move up, it's going to be critical for them to try and make that move. So here's how it's going to work. Tennessee knows that they have to get 3,000 to get to that first round pick. And if they're going to go for the second round pick, they have to find at least 2,600. Knowing that, that's where the trade comes in, and this is where you have to be creative. The team that you're trading with is in the number one slot, is going to want value. So you have to be creative in a certain way. You know you're going to have to give up first round picks, but you can mix and match some. But for the simplest of reasons, I need to go big. And for the audience to understand as clearly as I can and give them the most simplistic view of it, you're going to have to go very big in this draft in order to move up. So say Tennessee sitting at 28. I know I'm going to have to try and give everything I can to move up to that number one slot. And I have to give them what they want. What they want is value. What they want is future picks. Maybe even a player thrown in. I want to make it as easy for that team in the number one slot to know that they are basically paying for an investment. So here's what's going to happen. And I think this is the easiest and the best way to make people understand that how this trade could go down. This could very well be one of the biggest trades in NFL history if Tennessee's willing to do it. So in order to get that number one pick, here's the deal right now. Two scenarios. Tennessee could give up three first-round picks and Ryan Tannehill with a restructured contract. And I think you have to add that incentive. So if you're willing to eat up a little bit of that cap space in order to bring in one of those quarterbacks, I think that kind of sweetens the pot. But... Then again, you have to understand maybe some teams just want picks, and that's fine. So along those lines for the second deal, I'm willing to give not only four first-round picks, but a second-round pick in 2024, which would be the highest draft trade deal in NFL history. So if you're going to go all, and you're going to go all in, this is the time. And I'm going to be serious with you guys. Trades for that number one spot are going to get higher and higher. That's how it goes. Eventually, there's other ways you could work this around. You could mix third round picks. You could potentially mix second and third round picks. But here's the thing. I know one of these two quarterbacks is going to be chased after hard. And they are going to change a franchise. Maybe they both will. Maybe this is a scenario where you have two 
generational talents take over a franchise and they basically become just rivals for the next 10 or 15 years. So what I know at this point, you need to go all in. Your window's open. You have the opportunity to make a difference and try and seize on that championship momentum, just like Kansas City did. Granted, they moved up 17 spots. I'm talking about possibly moving up 26 or 27. The NFL's full of parity, and it's very doable. So along those lines, if Tennessee's willing to make that move, it's very well worth it. And I know some of you think it's crazy, but that's okay. There's going to be plenty of deals in this draft that people are going to think are crazy. Sometimes they pay off, sometimes they don't. But I promise you, along those lines, you have to be creative. And especially trying to go for that number one pick that you know is going to be coveted over. Whatever team is in that one or two slot, they're going to hold on to, and you've got to make it worth their while. And if you're willing to move the capital and you're willing to take that risk, it's worth it. I mean, look at the Rams. They haven't had first-round picks in at least the last three or four years. And they've made it work to their benefit. So would it hurt that much to just give up at least four or three first-round picks? I don't think that's so bad. It's hard to swallow, and it's hard to comprehend, and it's infuriating at times. But I still think sometimes you have to take these risks. And sometimes they pay off, sometimes they don't. That's part of the gamble. And along those lines, it's teams like that that either make a difference or they fall flat on, flat on their face. And in J-Rob's case, if everybody's wanting to try and bust through that glass ceiling that Tennessee has had a hard time of, it's now or never. So you're in or you're out. And at this point, I'm going to go all in. I am going to force any team in that slot to say no to me. And I promise you, they're going to think very, very hard before they do say no. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick 30-second break. And when we come back, I am going to go ahead and let you know Tennessee can still add a few playmakers here and there. So who can we bring in? Well, i got an idea, and I'll let you know. Well, Michael Bishop with the power, and we'll be back in 30 seconds. The Power Hour is on the air, live streaming on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Twitch. I'm your host, Michael Bishop. Thank you for joining us on this Monday evening. And I've got a lot of comments to get to, so I am sorry, guys. Sometimes I just run long, and I try and make sure that I get everybody's comments while I'm in here, so my apologies for that. So, KJ Jefferson is my hope for the future. I mean, we'll see what he can do. I mean, it's a long... It's a long way to see when we can bring him in, but I'm willing to give him a shot if he has to shot to do what he can and help his team. So if he's available, I'm down. Titan Pratt says I'm going to leave, got to run. Well, good seeing you, buddy. Always have good having you on the show. Let's see, tight man, can wait one more year for my man? I mean, we can. I'm not trying to disparage it, and I'm not saying that it's not out of the realm of possibility. I mean, you know, whoever's going to be in that number one slot can change from year to year. So, you know, can he work out? I don't know. I mean, along those lines, you really have to think, especially with the guys that I just talked about. I mean, KJ could work out. He couldn't. I don't know. I just know that if Tennessee's going to try and hit in the championship window, you go big or go home. So, I mean, that's that's all it is. It's just one of those deals, man. And it's no problem, you know. 
And I'm glad you like the idea. I mean, that's just what it's there for. I just don't think it's a situation where Tennessee can continue to waste its window. And if you're going to do it, go big or go home. Kansas City did it, and it worked out for them. And I'm not saying every situation is like Kansas City's. Sometimes you just got to roll the dice. And speaking of rolling the dice, Tennessee still has a chance to add a few playmakers here and there if they're willing to make the chance and make a little bit of cap room, especially after the Julio Jones deal comes undone. And it frees up a lot of cap space. So who can Tennessee bring in potentially to help make this team a little more better? And once again, we jump into one of my favorite segments, and the Playmaker. So basically, I really like looking around and trying to find talent in certain places to see what Tennessee can do to help make themselves stronger on the offensive or defensive side of the balls. And really... I like what the defense is this year. I think if they decide to add for depth, I think that would be fine. I think linebacker is definitely a position that's being undervalued, especially knowing I know we have Cunningham. I know we have, you know, Monty Rice in the wings, and I know we've got David Long, but at the same time, depth is key. So I don't think that that should discourage Tennessee from drafting later linebacker picks in the draft. In fact, I think that helps it. But I also feel one of the scenarios you need to do in order to better the team is to find a way to bring in a playmaker that can help elevate the team. And an interesting interesting free agent right now that's still out there at the moment would be an Indomitian Sioux. And yes, I think it's a funny idea to bring in a 35-year-old veteran, but at the same time, He's still producing. And the crazy thing is he played on a torn PCL most of last year, and he's already getting it surgically repaired. So I want to make my defense even stronger. And this defense already is strong. I love the depth that we have, and I know they're going to add more pieces, but I still feel that sometimes you just look at a guy and you think if you add him, he can be a difference maker. Now, Ndamukong Sue is not going to be a guy that's breaking down the doors. Let's just be real. He's 35, and last year he averaged six sacks being hurt on a partially torn PCL joint. So, that being said, he averaged six sacks last year. So, add that to the total of what Tennessee already had. Jeffrey Simmons is already the man. You know he's going to be the main man in the middle. So why not have somebody to compliment him? Sue still has the athletic ability. Sue can still break through tackles. He still can bat passes. He still has that athletic edge. And that's what I want to add. I want to add playmakers. You know, secondary is a very big need. But I also think one of the strengths Tennessee has, and turned into a strength last year was the defensive line and it's the service of tier tart it's the service of jeffrey simmons it's the service of harold landry and hopefully bud dupree when he gets healthy and adding a ola daney in the mix as a backup that could still go out and get sacks and i can't forget about autry so that's already a stacked defensive line and if i'm adding the dominican sue I'm basically just telling teams, I'm going to go out there and dare your offensive line to try and beat me. Tennessee prides itself right now in being a tough, hard-nosed, punch-you-in-the-mouth team. And that's Ndamukong Sioux style. He can get after you. He can still be the difference maker. I don't have to have him as a 10-12 to sack guy. I just need him to be a serviceable player. And he can still bring it. So I like the fact that he's still out on free agency. He's still shopping himself around. And if you're willing to put yourself out there for the right price, which he's already just taken one-year deals with the Buccaneers, you know, I figured he wants to try and maybe get one more good payday in, but he's already at the point where he could possibly be serviceable. So this is where you're going to have to be creative. And, Get into some of the comments real quick. And Lou says, Stavon Austin. And I'll try and touch on, you know, return guys a little more. 
possibly next week. I'll have a lot of people on the show, so I'm going to have a lot of opinions to have on return guys. So I promise you, Lou, man, there's not going to be a shortage of return men that I'm actually looking at. So I try and at least bump ideas off the wall every once in a while. And going back to Al Pierce, how much cap would Sue cost us? And here's the thing, Al. I know Sue's going to want probably what he's been getting at the time that he was with the Bucks. In the last three years, I think it was about, he had 8.5. Uh, then his last contract came out to about $9 million, and I think it was about 6 guaranteed. So Tennessee would have to be creative in order to build up cap space with this. So I think maybe you'd have to give him about a $10 million, one dollar de- one-year $10 million deal and about six of that guaranteed. So I think if you could get Taylor, Taylor Lewan to restructure his contract, I think that's doable. I think you bring him in and elevate that defensive line. I don't think it's a bad investment. I think there are other things they could go after. But, you know, sometimes it's a gamble. And like a lot of these playmakers, I think sometimes it's a gamble. Like one of the shows I had a few weeks ago, I said they should go after Gronk. Gronk's still out there. He's definitely worth the money. And I think I had him about maybe at about $9 million for one year. So, you know, guys like Sue, they're not going to get a lot of money at this point in their career. He's already 35. You know, it's not like he can't play. He's very serviceable. In fact, at the time when Julius Pepper was up for free agency, maybe would seem like six or seven years ago, I was screaming at Tennessee to take a chance at him. Yes, he was an older player, but he was still serviceable. He could get out there and still get after players, and he did. When he was re-signed, I believe when Green Bay took him up for another year. So sometimes a one-year guy can make a difference. Strengthen what you already have, and Tennessee's defensive line is already strong enough. So I don't think that's bad money invested. I think that's a good investment, especially since... John Robinson tried to go after him a few years ago. Unfortunately, he decided to go with the Rams, and it just didn't work out that way. But he made Buffalo, well, he made Tampa Bay work out, and ever since then, he's been taking one year deals. And I think at this point, he's going to continue to take one year deals. So, strategy wise, you know, investment wise, I want to bring in a guy that I know is going to strengthen our core. I'm not asking him to be the guy, I'm just asking him to be a very working a very good working cog in an already very well functioning and oiled machine so if sue is willing to take that i really like this defensive line to me that's a pretty big upgrade and tierra tart's good but indomitian sue's better and if i can add a guy that adds at least six plus sacks that's not a bad trade-off and it just gives the titan something that every NFL championship winning team has depth and they have to have that depth in order to make a difference. And I scream it. I will scream it out at the top of my lungs. Depth is key. I mean, it says, yeah. And if someone would get injured, we would have such a replacement. And that's the idea. I really want to get a guy in there that you don't have to worry about. He played injured last year on a torn PCL from what I'd read in the reports. And it didn't affect him at all. You know, he's mentally trained himself to basically play through the pain. So he's already had the surgery. He'll be fine. He'll be more than likely ready to go before training camp starts. Just they'll probably walk him through it. But you upgrade that defensive line. Tennessee's already punch you in the mouth team. Why not add another piece that can really punch somebody in the mouth? And Sue's definitely worth a one-year investment, at least on my end. Well, all right, guys, let us go ahead and take a quick 30-second break. And when I come back, let's take a little trip down memory lane. And unfortunately, it's between 2012 and 2015, but I promise you, there's always a silver lining to even a bad story. So I'm Michael Bishop of the Power Hour, and we'll be back in 30 seconds. 
tired of not being able to find the Power Hour on YouTube? Getting frustrated? There's got to be a better way. Well, now there is. Hey Alexa, find the Power Hour Tennessee Titans. All right, it's that simple. So sit back, relax, and watch every old episode and new ones drop every Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern. And don't forget, subscribe, like, and ring the bell for more content. The Power Hours on the air, live streaming on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Twitch. I'm your host, Michael Bishop, and thank you for joining me this Monday evening on our show. It's always great having everybody in. And once again, I want to apologize for the cancellation of our guests. Just unavoidable circumstances. We will have Sean Cauldron back on next week, along with Titan Time Podcast. And we'll eventually get P-Shark back in. He had a prior engagement, which he was supposed to fill in tonight, but... These things happen, man, and I'm not upset about it. You just roll with the punches, and we're having a good show, so no worries. We'll get them on eventually, and thank you so much for once again watching the Power Hour. All right, everybody. In our last segment tonight, unfortunately, we're taking a bad trip down a bad road. And it's fortunate enough to give people perspective on how far the Titans have come. In the last three to four years they've been a playoff team one year they've gone to the afc championship and they continue to be contending for a potential super bowl but it seems not long ago back in 2012 after it just seemed like so much was going wrong mike reinfeld had basically left the team and rustin webster had joined in and was going to be the person that changed the whole dynamic but as we know many things like that were a very, very frustrating time. So going back, when the hiring was made, I can remember a lot of people felt that it was kind of a wishy-washy hire at the time. Uh, Webster had come from the Seattle Seahawks. He was an interim GM, and I believe he was 5-9 and nine from his time with the Seahawks. So you had a lot of questions if he was ready to step up in this role. He had been in a scouting position for most of his career and elevated himself up to the VP and GM level. So he had experience scouting. So like most good GMs, they are scouts eventually. So going into that role, you felt that he was going to end up bringing in some good players and make some good deals. And unfortunately, they're too far and removed and they're just too far away from each other but you got to ground through the pile and eventually webster did some pretty good things to tennessee one of them being delaney walker as he was definitely the best free agent signing that he had under that tenure walker became a very key component in the titans offense being their lead receiver for at least the last four to five years He was definitely one of the best signings that Webster could hang his hat on. Unfortunately, he was probably the best signing that they had at that time as well, with a slew of bad ones. And you you would have to also look at the draft. And this was a tough one for me, because Marcus Mariota was also a product of the Webster era. But I feel that Taylor Lewan has been the most serviceable draft pick. Yes, he's had his fair share of entries, but so is Mariota. But unfortunately, Luan still remains with the team. So I have to give the edge there. So for me, Webster, the best pick in the draft 2014 was Taylor Luan when he had the opportunity to take him. And he's been significantly good, and he's been a consistent for most of the part. And then you look at the times where he had to bring in keep our free agent guys and a lot of the times he didn't but the one thing that i will commend him for that he did a good job was to keep jerrell casey jerrell casey of course one of the most beloved tennessee titans if not one of the most beloved tennessee titans it was vital that they keep him at the time casey had come off a big year i believe he had posted 12 sacks so they knew that they had to try and keep one key component in the defense after so many years of losing key players, which Tennessee had been relentless at doing. So keeping Casey was a breath of fresh air. And I remember when they announced the signing, I just felt for the first time, you know, 
it really feels like, especially after Webster took the realm, that he was actually making a difference. So along those lines, you felt a little comfortability. You felt that he cared enough to sign the in-house talent. And if we lost Casey, I guarantee he probably would have went somewhere and contended for a Super Bowl, whether it be the Ravens or the Patriots at the time, or maybe even with the Ravens. I mean, it's a very likely possibility. He was a very sought-after free agent, and Webster was able to keep him. So I will give him that and give credit where credit's due. But unfortunately, that's about where all I'm going to stop the credit at. Because we have to look at what Webster did at his time in Tennessee and just evaluate it as it was. 1846 as the GM in 64 games posted a 28.12 win percentage. Meaning that basically they would win about, I think it was 2.3 games a year. Out of the four years that he was the GM. And out of 32 players that he drafted in the NFL, only four are still in the NFL. One being Taylor Lewan, one being Marcus Mariota, and Daquan Jones being the other, and Avery Williamson, I really don't know right now because he hasn't been signed to a team. So it could technically be three. But speaking of three, I also have to like tab the three head coaches on him. Now, I know Mike Malarkey was in an interim position, but, I mean, basically, we knew Webster was eventually going to make him the coach, no matter what happened. Or whatever GM was hired at the time, I had the biggest suspicion that Malarkey was going to be retained for familiarity. And especially going through a rebuild, it's a little easier, especially keeping the players locked in with a familiar face. So I will lock that higher end to him as well. And the biggest thing out of all that, Webster ended up getting fired in 2015, but it was funny how it worked. His contract just ended, but he was basically fired. We can just say it as it is. And Webster eventually went on to be one of the head scouts at the Atlanta Falcons facility and still is. In fact, funny enough, he was actually offered the Las Vegas Raiders GM position before they went another direction. So he was definitely one of the interviewees and they were looking at him. So if history repeated itself, I mean, the Raiders probably could have had Webster as their GM and maybe their executive VP of personnel decisions. So I think they dodged a bullet there. So good for you guys. But here's the moral of the story here. Out of all those four years that we went through, out of all the turmoil, out of all the heartbreak, out of all the frustration, you know, the three and thirteen year, the two and fourteen year, we ended up with John Robinson afterwards. And the optimism just shot through the roof. And I know people got excited that there was hope, and John Robinson went in and started tearing down things and rebuilding and rebranding and being aggressive, and doing what we wanted our GM to be doing in the first place. I can tell you from experience, those were some of the worst years that I've ever experienced as a football fan. The negativity, the hatefulness, just the anger, the frustration, even before social media was blowing up at the time, it was just so unbearable at times where you had so many people that were just at each other's throats and the consistent bickering, it just felt unending. But luckily through something bad, something good has happened. Tennessee is relevant, at least to us. In the national media, it's a different story. But at the same time, you can't overlook what they've done. They consistently have found ways to get to the playoffs. They've consistently found ways to win more games each year. Mm-hmm. And they're trying to vie for themselves to try and win a Super Bowl, which is something at that time we couldn't even dream of. So my whole point is you have to remember what you went through to appreciate where you are now. Can things be better? Of course they can but they can always be like they were in 2012 through 2015. 
And I know nobody wants to go back there. So the biggest thing is just remember, we're going to get where we want to go. I promise you, trust what we're doing. Take a deep breath. Step back. Look at the bigger picture. It'll be okay. We've come this far. We just have to finish the job. And whatever we have to do going forward, let's just do it right. And let's do it how proud Tennessee Titan fans should be doing it. As reliable fans and reliable caretakers of our team. And let's support them the way we can and the way we should. All right, guys, I want to thank you so much for joining me on tonight's show. I do apologize once again for our cancellation of guests. I promise you next week we're going to have a full house in here. So come prepared. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. We will have Sean Calderon on back as soon as we can. And we will have Titans Time podcast so it will be a full house in the next few weeks will even be fuller so make sure you get back as soon as you can and don't forget if you're watching on youtube don't forget to subscribe like and ring the bell for more content before you leave and don't forget if you love our show help it grow follow us on facebook twitter twitch and tiktok at the power hour 615 so for everybody i want to thank you once again and wish you a good night so i'm michael bishop of the power hour take care Tighten up.